This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Don Moore and Max Bazerman. Now, for me, this is actually quite pretty exciting because both Don and Max have been on this podcast before, but in their individual capacities and not as co-authors. And Don is a professor at Berkeley Haas and Max is a professor at Harvard Business School, but they've also um, worked together on a number of papers, projects, and books. Most recently, this book, Decision Leadership, Empowering Others to Make Better Choices. But of course, they've also worked on this classic book, Judgment in Managerial Decision Making. And at the very beginning of this book, it says, you know, this book, when it was, we started working together in 1986. And I was thinking, wait, Don must have been, you know, like 20 years old, right? Or whatever, when this thing first came out. And I remember actually getting the first edition of, maybe it was the second edition, but I had this as a text in a class that I took in 1991 with Howard Kunreuther at the Wharton School. And so I've been basically the owner of almost every single successive edition of this book. So welcome, Don and Max. Thanks. And thanks from Wiley, the publisher who kept on wanting to make all those extra editions of Judgment and Managerial Decision Making. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be here and great to be here with Don. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about this book for the most part, Decision Leadership. And, you know, I found this book very interesting because it brings together two different strands of pedagogy and research, you know, in business schools, there, there's always this schism between, I think, the organizational behavior people and the economics people, right? So the economics people, they focus on organizational design, they focus on incentives, they focus on the allocation of decision rights, and then the organizational behavior people, they focus on things like culture, they focus on things like individual differences, they focus on motivation, right? And I've always been very puzzled by why these two camps fail to really engage with one another and fail to kind of talk to one another. And, and I think people have realized that. And so these things are coming together and you realize you can't kind of do organizational design without understanding motivation. And you can't try to influence motivation if you don't understand decision right allocation and so forth. And so you use this term, which I really loved, where you describe the firm or really any organization as a decision factory, right? I love this terminology because it really does describe what organizations do. And then you say that to be a leader, you have to be a decision architect, right? You have to create an environment where the people in the organization make better decisions. And this, I think, is a change in the way we think of leadership because leadership has always been about the decisions that the leader makes and much less about the decisions that the leader enables. So I, I really, I love the motivation behind the book. And I was wondering if you both had uh, felt this kind of dichotomy and uh, whether you think that dichotomy is, is sort of a thing of the past or will soon be a thing of the past. Thanks, Greg. You have correctly identified the niche we like to occupy between psychology, organizational behavior, and economics. And that perspective, I think, was uh, nicely described by Howard Rafe as asymmetrically prescriptive descriptive, wherein we want to accurately describe the behaviors, the predilections, the failures, the limitations, the powers, and the biases of the people who are operating in real organizations in the real world. And at the same time, we want to keep an eye on rational prescription, considering how those people should be making decisions if they want to maximize their own welfare, the welfare of their teams, the welfare of their organizations, and the welfare of the broader society. And it's easy as our book notes, to find the many circumstances in which people's decisions deviate from that rational ideal. We hope in our book to offer guidance that can help people and organizations through more effective leadership become better, more rational, more effective at realizing their own goals through better decisions. Max? So I think that academia is filled with dichotomies. So after Kahneman and Tversky did their groundbreaking research in the 70s, 
in the eighty in the early eighties, economists were still sort of denying that Kahneman and Tversky were onto something. When sort of the world of behavioral economists basically bought on and said, looks like Kahneman and Tversky and Thaler were right, and this field of behavioral economics developed, kind of psychology and economics came together in a very powerful way. And in many ways, behavioral economics has boomed as one of the leading topics of social science in the last couple of decades. And then you get a different dichotomy between this area of behavioral decision research, behavioral economics, and organizational behavior. And that's the bridge I think that we're trying to bring together. Um, We're trying to, to bring the power of the behavioral economics world with the fact that leaders can do so much to not only benefit from the wisdom of the behavioral economics literature to make better decisions themselves, but think about what are the environmental characteristics that they control that can lead their employees, their customers, their stakeholders broadly to make wiser decisions, make the company more effective, but also make society better off as a result. So I see all kinds of dichotomies running around here. And I think the one we're bridging is connecting the decision community to the organizational behavior community. And for a long time, I think the decision types who have existed within the, be- within the organizational behavior community have been kind of off to the side doing their own thing. And we think that's a mistake. We want to use the power of behavioral economics to make the topic of leadership more powerful and more actionable. So look, I mean, when we think of business schools, they often talk about being in the leadership business, right? People come in and we're supposed to crank out leaders, okay? And, you know, economists have always been kind of skeptical of this notion, right? Because they, they, you know, if the definition of a leader is someone who kind of changes hearts and minds, right? Who inspires, who, you know, gets up on the podium and gets everybody excited about stuff, right? Economists don't know what to do with that because they, they think that kind of preferences are more or less fixed. And if you want somebody to do something, you got to just give them a reward or a punishment rather than kind of changing their minds. Now, even our economics classes say economics for leaders. And you know, my strategy class is called strategic leadership. So we, we, we just, it's almost like we staple the word leadership on the end, but economists are still perplexed about what this leadership thing is. And you point out that, you know, maybe the leadership business has kind of invested too much in this idea that you've got to kind of change hearts and minds to inspire people, right? So is leadership, I mean, is leadership becoming a more respectable discipline and is it only becoming more respectable through the incorporation of a little bit of economics and a little bit of, you know, social psychology and decision theory? What is the status of leadership as an academic discipline right now? So I don't think that we need to evaluate the existing leadership literature. I mean, it's been around for decades and there's lots of people of lots of different views and people in the real world still buy books with leadership in the title. So they seem to be interested in this topic. So our goal isn't to disagree with past books, but to say, we think that we have something new and creative and useful for the leader that may be a powerful addition. So um, I was intrigued by your use of idea of hearts and minds, because a number of years ago, about half a dozen years ago, I was the co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard. So the word leadership was in it. And within the Center for Public Leadership, I was also the co-founder and co-director of the Behavioral Insights Group, which was largely a group focused on what we think of as behavioral economics, behavioral decision research. And I had an amazing panel with David Labson and Mike Norton and Cass Sunstein. And I was the moderator and I thought the session was going quite well. And then somebody from what you might consider the more traditional leadership literature raised his hand and said, this is all very, very intriguing. But as I understand it, leadership has to do with changing the hearts and minds of people. And you seem to be happy to change behavior without changing hearts and minds. How is that leadership? And David Labson basically chimes in and says, you know, in the idea, in the area of retirement savings, leaders can have more of an impact by changing defaults than they can have by changing hearts and minds. And if we can have a 
10 times larger impact skipping hearts and minds to get a good behavior should a leader, should a leader do it, absolutely. And Cass Sunstein kind of reiterated the point saying, a leader should use whatever tools work to get effective results. And there are so many domains where we know how to change behavior in a positive direction, positive for the individual, positive for the organization, positive for society. And should we take those things out of the out of the arsenal of leader behavior because it hasn't been in the traditional literature? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I think that I agree with Cass's summary comment. We're simply adding some new tools. And, you know, when we think about leadership, we often think about people moving heavy objects from one side of the factory to the other. That isn't what most of our leaders coming out of Haas and, and HBS are doing these days. They're guiding an organization to make better decisions. And that's where the decision factory idea comes from. And that's where our motivation comes from to help leaders create better decisions throughout their organization. So, so Don, I mean, do you think that this represents almost a migration of ideas that have been dominant in marketing over into the area of organizational behavior, right? Because in marketing, we're just trying to do whatever works, right? And sometimes to do what works means to kind of meet the customer where they are. And, you know, a lot of that involves creating a frictionless experience, right? And so we want the customer to engage the product. If it means convincing them, to, you know, the, the how awesome our product is, you know, well, that, that might be one way to do it. If it means kind of removing impediments to their, you know, purchasing the product by, you know, making it one click instead of 10 clicks, you know, that's, that's just as good, right? That, if, it, if that works, great, let's use it. So, you know, within the organization, if we're trying to get people to do things, then we just meet our employee where they are, right? And accept them for as they are and with the, the peculiarities and stuff that they have and provide them with an environment that gets them to do the desired activity or to make the desired type of decision. Is that a fair description of how we can you know, rethink organizational leadership? I think that's an intriguing characterization. And I would add to it that we want to encourage decision makers to think broadly about their interests and the interests of those who are affected by their decisions. That is the leader's perspective, not just what serves my interest, but what serves the long-term interests of the stakeholders of the organization and others affected by my decisions, those who depend on me, those who I influence, right? So the marketing perspective that you describe that meets consumers where they are also capitalizes on their foibles to indulge their predilection to make decisions that might not be in their best interest, to consume too much in the moment, to consume too much fatty, unhealthy food. By contrast, we want to bring in explicitly a prescriptive perspective, which considers the larger perspective of the welfare of those affected by the decision and asks, how can we structure the decision environment, not just to make the decision easy, but to make desirable behavior easy, where desirable behavior is behavior that helps realize the goals, aspirations, and ethical standards of those affected. So if, if I could simply add on to what Don was saying, in a way quite consistent, sort of if I, if I have a problem with the consumer behavior literature and marketing, it's that too often the dependent variable, the outcome we're looking for is does the customer buy or not? And as Don suggests, we're much more interested in does the customer, does the employee make a wise decision, wise for themselves, wise for the organization and wise for the broader society. So simply buying, I don't think that we want a parallel to that. We want a parallel to making wise decisions. Right. But when we look at the, I mean, the judgment and managerial decision-making book, I think of this book as part of the effort to kind of de-bias or let's say improve the kind of decision-making capacity of a manager or of a leader or pretty much of anybody who reads the book. Yes. And I think of what a lot of what we do in, in the business school project is about kind of debiasing or helping people to make better decisions by altering their internal kind of processes. But as you point out that, you know, situations 
uh, are often, you know, more determinative of outcome than kind of what the individual brings to the table. And so I think of them as compliments, but is this sort of a shift on both of your parts kind of away from like debiasing and a little bit more towards there's limits to how much you can debias. And so you need to create a choice architecture that kind of leverages the peculiarities and imperfections of people. I don't think we've changed our views from the earlier book. I think that for decades, there have been lots of efforts to debias human intuition, and we haven't been all that successful in doing that. And the Judgment and Managerial Decision-Making book highlighted that two important strategies to, is to get people out of intuitive decision-making and, and into deliberative decision-making for important decisions. So we've always been a big fan of getting out of what Kahneman or Stanovich and West call System 1 and, and move into System 2 for the important stuff. And our previous book was also a fan of nudging. The big difference between our earlier book and the current book, well, a few differences. The new book is obviously updated. It's written more for a trade audience. But most importantly, we're writing a leadership book more than a decision-making book. The decision-making literature are our tools to help leaders guide not just them, but a broader set of people to wiser decisions. So you could think of if a leader read our earlier book on judgment and managerial decision-making, we hope it would have led them to prescriptions to make better decisions and decisions themselves. We now want to provide a clear guide to how do you get lots of people to make wiser decisions. I would just add by saying that we would love it if our book could transform everyone who reads it into wise, thoughtful, reflective, perfectly rational, expected value maximizers. Short of that, we're okay if people make wise decisions, even if they haven't eliminated all the biases that they might be vulnerable to. Right. I mean, I think it was Plato who made the distinction between, what is it, like true belief and I don't even remember what the distinction was. Like, you know, you're, you're right, but maybe you're not right for the, for the right reasons. I mean, when we think of these nudge initiatives, right, so the behavioral insight groups that whether they're governmental or whether they're corporate, at the end of the day, they're, they're interested in, in the outcome, right? So when you put the frosted glass in front of the Coca-Cola, right, and this leads to a reduction in carbonated, sugary, soft drink consumption, then mission accomplished. But you haven't in any way stimulated kind of system two thinking. I mean, you haven't given this employee a brochure on the harmful effects of sugar, and you haven't gotten them to kind of reflect on the trade-offs between current satisfaction and long-term health outcomes. You've just made them healthier in a way that is almost operating at the subconscious. And isn't that what nudge initiatives are all about? I mean, are there nudge initiatives that are designed to stimulate better thinking or are the nudge initiatives necessarily about giving up on creating better thinking? So let's go and replace your Coca-Cola story with redesigning the cafeteria to provide greater access to plant-based food options that happen to also be tastier. And that it may introduce people to new foods that they have never eaten before. Am I happy to, in the short term, get people to simply eat more plant-based products that they find tasty and affordable? Yes, I do. But I would love it if they then said, oh, I haven't had this plant-based product before and I actually like it. And now to engage in system two thinking, to think about how they want to design, redesign their diet more broadly. So Long before behavioral economics, uh, Daryl Bem, in what I consider to be his most interesting work, identified that we often learn about our attitudes by looking at our behavior. And if um, I start eating plant-based products, if I start recycling more, I may learn something about my attitudes by seeing the fact that I'm behaving in a certain way. And that's a way in which our intuitive system system one processes may influence our long-term system two processes. So certainly I want to think about changing behavior, but I also want to change it from a long-term perspective. So the nice thing about system two thinking, more deliberative thinking, is it's more generalizable. So if I understand why I'm engaging in the behavior, I'm more likely to repeat it in a sustainable way. 
if you simply drive my behavior without my conscious deliberation, I think it's there's less reason to believe that it's going to affect my behavior when you aren't around nudging it next week as well. So I'm perfectly in favor of nudging good behaviors, but I am interested in having a longer term impact, not just on today's decisions, but all of your decisions. So if you did have an initiative like that with the frosted glass, like they do at Google, I took a picture of it. I use it in my class as an example. Uh, of an effective intervention. Where you hide the junk food behind the frosted glass, you're saying. Yes, exactly. Right. And it's, you know, it is an effective intervention from everything I've heard. You know, would it then make sense for you after you've been doing this for a while and you've observed the efficacy of it to maybe put a little brochure beside the cooler so that people can grab it and say, oh, wow, look, this is what's been happening and this is why it's been happening. And then that would sort of stimulate some reflection on one's behavior. Would that be the best combination? If only people read brochures. <laughs> <laughs> My simple answer would be yes, but there may be other ways to reinforce the positive behavior that the college junior who just ate a plant-based meal would find appealing. So whether it's videos as you're leaving, whether it's follow-up emails, whether it's text, um, whether it's TikTok videos, whether, uh, we can think of just lots of different things that might reinforce that meal. But the basic concept of reinforcing and making it more deliberative. Absolutely. Now, in the book, you, you guys, you both talk about the role of the leader as a kind of educator of sorts, right? And you didn't use the word coach, but I kept thinking of this idea of a coach because you, you say you want to train your employees to become better decision makers. You want to train them in kind of basic decision making methodology. You want to explain to them what expected value is and, you know, risk neutrality. I mean, maybe, you know, you use different terminology, but the idea is that, you know, you have a lot of faith that some of these more basic principles of good quality management can be diffused through the organization through some internal educational initiatives. And, you know, I interviewed John List a while back and he described how he wrote this memo, think on the margin, right? Which we think of as very basic kind of day one micro type stuff. But just by creating this memo, and, and I guess, Don, they do read memos over at Lyft, he you know, sent this memo around, and he said it had a profound impact. This is pretty basic stuff, but do you think that it's possible to change the way people make decisions within an organization through internal educational initiatives? And if so, how would you design these? I mean, part of it's just about setting example. Part of it's about kind of one-on-one -on -one mentorship by leaders. But is there a way to do this through more kind of broader, more formal educational initiatives? Don, why don't you just tell Greg how to make people perfectly calibrated? I think that's what he's asking for. Yes, we are optimistic about the potential for human corrigibility, that although we don't start out perfect, that we can get better and it's worth investing in, in that improvement. On the other hand, we just expressed some skepticism about the leader's role is changing hearts and minds. So we think that investing in empowering employees, giving them the information that they need, the tools and the knowledge to make wiser decisions on behalf of themselves and the large organization, yes. And sometimes leadership means structuring the decision environment to make it easy for people to choose what's in their interest when they're lazy or not paying attention or lack the information. Right. So in other words, the educational initiative, if it's not accompanied by actual rewards and punishments, you know, will ultimately be thwarted to some degree, right? If you, if you sort of say, hey, you know, here's this thing called motivated blindness, right? You know, you really ought to pay attention to it. But then we kind of reward people who look the other way and we kind of punish people who point out things that, that nobody wants pointed out, then those things will just be sort of empty gestures, right? So, you know, you guys mentioned a couple different companies that you think do a pretty good job in some of these domains like Netflix and Amazon. And Amazon is known for having its 14-point defining principles, right? We at Berkeley Haas have defining principles. But, you know, these things are not just kind of mantras that people repeat, but they are reinforced by the incentives, right? So do you think that leaders spend too much time on the mantras and not enough on auditing the kind of reinforcement mechanisms that they're imposing on the organization? 
the aspect of Amazon's culture that I like the best is not actually those 14 leadership principles. It is the six page memos that they prepare for each other before making important decisions in which the champions of a decision are expected to justify the risk that they're advising the company to take on the basis of sensible forecasts and expected value calculations, what they know at the time that they're making the decision. That is essential for allowing the organization to improve the calibration of its confidence judgments and its forecasts and rewarding wise decision-making, even when that means taking a risk. It means that Amazon has been willing, more than lots of other companies, to take risks with positive expected values where the odds were against them. Where, for instance, Amazon might anticipate a 100 to 1 payoff from a risky project that stands a 90% chance of failure. Well, that is a highly positive expected value. The company should invest in that opportunity big time. But nine times out of 10, the champion leading that project will wind up with egg all over their face because it's not going to succeed. And they know that ex ante. Detailing that expected value logic in a memo that you can look back at afterwards and think about what, if anything, you have to learn allows Amazon more than many other companies to celebrate well-intentioned failure. Smart, positive expected value bets that don't always turn out exactly as hoped. But where's the teeth in the performance evaluation phase when you're trying to evaluate people for compensation and for promotion, right? Is that where this gains teeth? Because if it doesn't have teeth and the reward system is not in alignment with this stated cultural principle. If what you're talking about, Greg, is rewarding performance, we take an emphatic stance against that in our book. Results-based leaders wind up rewarding the lucky and punishing the unlucky. Teeth in rewarding good performance and wise decisions? Absolutely. And Amazon, in my understanding of their decision process, has very high standards when it comes to the quality of the evidence that's presented in those six-page memos, right? You bring some poorly reasoned argument with a lousy track record of being over-optimistic about every opportunity that's ever come your way, and you're going to face a lot of skepticism from higher-ups in the company. What you want is to reward good decision processes in your organization. They're not always going to turn out. You won't always be lucky. But if you place smart, positive expected value bets whenever you have the chance to do so, in aggregate, you will wind up better off and if you just reward results. And Max, these books are, they cover some of your greatest hits and both of your greatest hits. And Max, you wrote a book a while back on kind of noticing and the importance of, of noticing. And one of the key principles you point out when you rattle off these principles is, right, the importance of, of noticing. And you talk about situations like Theranos and WeWork. And I guess the question is, why do we still see, why is it so pervasive, this blindness, right? I mean, it's easy, of course, in, in retrospect to say, oh yeah, you should have seen this. But a lot of these, it's not just retrospect. <laughs> I mean, it's in, in real time, there are people that can see that you're being blind, right? And you, you talk a lot about kind of the yes man industry. And there's a third party, commercial third yes man industry we call consulting, but inside of organizations, being the, the yes man or the yes woman is, is, is a surefire path to the top. So why do we still see these things when they seem to be so obviously dysfunctional? We can extend that list. You, you gave us uh, um, Elizabeth Holmes and Adam Newman, but we can certainly add Bernie Madoff to that story and lots of other people where there's evildoers. And the question is, why did other people allow this behavior to occur? So in one, in one exercise that I have given to at this point, thousands of MBE and executive students, I show people four different returns from four different investment organizations over a nine-year period of time. And they also, have, they also get the S&P 500 as a benchmark for this decision. And the question is, which of these four funds do you invest in, A, B, C, or D? And one of the funds, which is called Fortitude in our simulation, is basically Madoff's reported returns over the nine years right before the collapse. And it performed dramatically above the market with almost no volatility. 
And fortitude is the overwhelming favorite of any audience I've ever presented the problem to. It gets between 70 and 90% of the vote. And after I kind of crowdsource what I should invest in from the audience, and they t convince me fortitude, I then say, is there anything wrong with any of these funds? And then very quickly, multiple people will have the insight that they just picked fortitude, but in fact, fortitude isn't possible that you can't dramatically outperform the market over a nine-year period of time with absolutely no volatility. So first they pick it, and then they realize it's impossible. So what's going on? Well, my excellent colleague, Ann Tenbrunsel, has this term ethical fading to describe that when we have a task, we often focus on some characteristics or some, some criteria and ignore others. And when I ask you what to invest in, people are looking for high return and low volatility. And the ethicality, legality, feasibility of the funds becomes very distant. Now, this is a minor problem for my executive student who only saw the problem for 10 minutes. But the more interesting question is, how did so many people with degrees from organizations that we think highly of with PhDs and MBAs sort of put their own money, their clients' money, their family's money into Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme? And my answer is because they were focused on a narrow set of criteria, and they needed to be thinking about a broader set of criteria, including feasibility. And with that criteria in place, they would have known that Bernie Madoff was not a place to put their important resources. So I think that all through life, people are focusing on how Adam Newman is changing the real estate world and how Elizabeth Holmes has, is kind of a revolutionary figure. So of course, we have to keep things secret. But when stuff doesn't make sense, I think we need to learn that we need to look harder and we need to search for the right evidence. When I'm not going to bore you with a long-winded story of one I didn't notice, but when I tell this long-winded story to executives, they, all, they always let me off the hook and they say what I did was completely reasonable. And when I talk to journalists, they say, yeah, we know the best stories are always when you can't figure out what's going on to begin with. And I think that more of us need to not accept the fact that I don't understand this problem and move back to problems that I do understand, but view the fact that I don't understand as a hint for digging in and learning more. And I think that we're more likely to notice important events in our environment. Well, you also talk about willingness to listen to others' opinions and, and the ability to incorporate other people's opinions into your decision-making process as a way of kind of reducing your own overconfidence and your own viewpoint and so forth. And so what I find interesting is that in the book, you, you kind of are flipping back and forth between rules for good individual decision making and rules for good kind of organizational design, right? So, you know, it's one thing for you to read this book and say, well, you know, I really ought to listen to other people, right? Or, you know, I, I really ought to kind of pay attention. But I think the thrust of your book is how do you create an environment where the individual decision makers are kind of becoming more virtuous in this respect, right? Who are adopting the, these principles, right? So you can teach the leader, but ultimately the, the leader is responsible for making sure that the people in the organization are behaving this way. Is there a difference between kind of cultivating your own internal capacities and, and designing an organization that has these capacities? We see those as complementary. Are the people with the best self-knowledge the ones that are best at kind of cultivating these attributes in their organizations? If I had to bet, I would bet that correlation is less than one, but it is positive, which is to say the leaders who have the wisdom and humility to accept criticism, to listen to input from others, to take advice and correct their mistakes, that those are also leaders who will, in general, be well positioned to offer that sort of guidance to others, to build organizations that are, in the words of Ray Dalio, idea meritocracies, where the best ideas can surface and that people aren't shy about engaging in rigorous dialogue and open disagreement with one another being hard on the issues, but soft on the people where you can show respect for your colleagues while at the same time holding them to a high standard of evidence and rigor 
in the quality of the arguments that they make and the calibration of the forecasts that they make. So much of our book is about how to bring forth the best evidence, whether that's team meetings, crowdsourcing. We talk about a variety of situations where one person doesn't have all the information. The question is how to best integrate that. And the book goes into substantial detail on multiple different processes to do that. And it highlights the fact that a leader isn't a unitary decision maker, almost by the name. A leader is leading other people. Well, you have that. You then have other resources, people who know more than you do. So if you ask me, my greatest skill is to realize that my doctoral students know so much more about me than on so many dimensions. Don is one of my former advisees. So you mentioned my 86 book. He was in high school, I think, at the time. And it was multiple editions later that I realized that Don knew much more about the current literature than I did and that that I could do a better job of revising the judgment book if Don joined me as a co-author. But, you know, I think that so much of my role, if, if if you think of my job as being an educational leader, and I think that we all are, I'm really good at noticing when other people have better ideas and better information than I do. And as a result, I've had the privilege of kind of mentoring a, an amazing slew of doctoral students, including Don and Maggie Neal and Katie Milkman and Todd Rogers and Dolly Chug and Vadupe Akinola and so on and so forth. But I think one of the things that made me good as a mentor, I think that's probably what I'm, I've been best at in my career, is not just telling them what to do, but benefiting from what they can do better than I can do and bringing that together in an integrated way. Well, but, and you know, we have examples from Ken Arrow where you can take a bunch of perfectly rational people and put them in a collective decision-making process and, and then the organization makes irrational decisions. You know, we also have examples and, and you, you know, you reference Adam Smith, right? There are examples where you can take a whole bunch of selfish people and throw them into a mix and wind up with, uh, you know, results that are socially wealth maximizing, right? And was it, I guess it was Alexander Hamilton that said, or James Madison, I forget which one said, you know, we're, n- we're never gonna have angels ruling over each other. So we might as well just pit these devils against each other. So when you're doing organizational design, do you need to kind of make the individuals better? Or is it really about process? and designing a process. I mean, if we think about, there's all sorts of research in, into adversarial judicial systems, right? Where the plaintiffs, the plaintiff's attorney and the defendant's attorney, they are presenting biased information and, and they offset one another to some degree and that might wind up with better decisions. So how much of it is about designing process and how much of it is about kind of helping individuals to understand these things? And, or is there, you know, in the old days, they used to divide the military into the officers and the men, do, you know, do we need the officers to be using their system too all the time? And then the quote men, we can just design an environment that works. No, we want we want to have people making smarter decisions throughout the organization. We certainly would reject this elitist notion that if the five people at the top are making good decisions, they can create an environment that will lead other people to use their intuition, and everything will come out right. That sounds like pretty bad advice. Well, we want to both educate the individual decision maker. We're not leaving that behind from our previous book, but we also want to figure out how the leader can, in in a variety of ways, influence the decisions of others. Um, Before you were talking about aggregating decisions, we've all heard the term of crowdsourcing and and kind of an average estimate of a large number of people seems to turn out well. Um, Rick Larrick and Jack Soule provide really interesting research, which we review in our book, that says, if you can identify five people who made pretty good decisions last year, five may be a big enough number to aggregate from. So we might get enough of our benefit from a fairly small number of select people. And they and we talk about what does it mean to select pretty good people to begin with. But so do we want those five to be smart? Do we want them to be making good decisions? Do we want them to follow good processes? Yes. But there still may be added benefit of aggregation. There may also be benefit of making sure that the people that we draw together into this combined decision-making process have diversity. So sort of aggregating five people who think alike doesn't provide the power of aggregating five very different views on the same problem. So We're a big fan of 
thinking more clearly and in, at an individual level, but also figuring out how to aggregate the information within the organization to make even better decisions than the educated individual could be. Greg, in your question, I heard a challenge to our recommendation that people get more rational in their decisions by noting the potential risks to the collective if what they're doing is playing public goods or prisoner's dilemma games, that everybody choosing rationally for themselves winds up destroying the collective. And that's where our advice to think more broadly, to take the perspective of a leader, to think about the ethical consequences of your decisions comes in to crucial play, where the broader perspective on rationality takes into account the collective consequences and whether your decisions make the aggregate better off. Here I think of our chapter in negotiation, where we talk a lot about integration in negotiation, how leaders are uniquely positioned to capitalize on the most wealth-creating, magical aspect of economics, and that is gains from trade. That by facilitating constructive, integrative gains from trade between people within the organization and between organizations, that will leave them in expectation better off. Yeah, and I think a lot of the problems that you guys articulate, there are ways of getting better decisions through some simple kind of process modifications, right? You know, just asking a series of questions or, you know, stopping and reflecting on certain things. And, and you can do this in a, in a directed and a systematic way. And I think you articulated in the judgment and management, measurable decision-making, there's a, there's a multi-step process, right? And there, the processes don't have to be super sophisticated. You talk about kind of linear addition models. I remember we learned about the AHP back in the day, right? And the analytical hierarchy process, I learned that back in the, in, the, in the 80s or 90s. Don, you were too young to remember this, but it was just sort of a simple set of steps that you could take. And it, would, it was a way of kind of auditing your decision making, right? So all of these things are kind of like auditing approaches. And if you're doing value construction and negotiations, it's just like, hey, let's just follow a couple of these steps and ask a bunch of these questions and we can get some kind of improvement. I mean, some of these seem like relatively easy wins. The hard part is, you know, how do you get people to be more methodical about following these procedures, right? We start with a leader understanding that they want better decisions, that they make a variety of decisions themselves that influence the decisions of lots of other people, and that there are very simple things that they can do that will lead people to deliberate more. So, Greg, you mentioned one kind of analytic process. Over the last 30 years, there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of different analytical processes. My guess is that any process that leads people to slow down, think about what you're trying to achieve, think about different options, think about the various criteria, weight those criteria, how many, whether there's six steps or eight steps isn't important. Thinking systematically really helps for the big decisions. And I think that leaders can do a lot to get away from the notion that you should simply trust your intuition or away from the idea that I can tell a great performer when I first meet them in 15 minutes, because by the way, they can't. So the, the fact that they trust their intuition to find people who they're, they're going to then trust to use their intuition is just a really bad pattern. We believe in deliberation on important stuff, and we think that leaders can develop that mentality and then create an environment in which more people within their organizations are making more deliberate, smarter, and more ethical decisions. I want to ask you guys about the ethical decision-making, because this is a big part of not only your personal concerns, but also, you know, the book. Isn't it cognitively demanding for people to think through all of the ripple effects and ramifications of their actions? I mean, Aren't they in some way depending on or trusting the organization to kind of provide them with the relevant incentives, right? In other words, you know, when I buy a book, I don't think, well, is the paperback using more resources than the hardback or, you know, did they use the right kind of wood here or, you know, to make the paper and, you know, is this paper from Malaysia or is it from Brazil, right? I mean, like, 
that's a lot of things to think about, right? And so a lot of people would hope that the government would provide <laughs> some good incentives, or at least within the organization, you would hope that, you know, hey, if the organization is rewarding me for doing this thing, and it's detrimental to the organization, right? Why should I, as the foot soldier, be the one that, if I see this and I think it's true, shouldn't I be skeptical of my own interpretation? There are smarter people than myself up there designing the rules. And I mean, how can we expect people to cognitively think through all of the ripple effects of their actions? Greg, I had no idea you were such an unethical book buyer. <laughs> hey, I, this one I didn't have to buy, so I don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> So, Greg, Greg, last week we did a book event with Barry Schwartz as the moderator for the Behavioral Change for Good Project. And, Don, my impression was that we ended up spending more than half the time on ethics. So, Barry ended up seeing this as an ethics book rather than a decision-making or leadership book. So, I'm glad that we're at least bringing the ethics into this domain. So, I think that there's so many things that are in our environment that we could audit and say we can do better. And some of them are just easy. So I think that leaders and the people who report to the highest level leaders should be on the alert for what are things that we do in this organization where we can not only make a more ethical decision, but it turns out to be a better decision as well. If we are looking for those, I think we can find lots of examples. I, I would bet that you can find them at the Haas School, and I think that I could find them at the Harvard Business School. And we're not under the expectation that someone who reads our book is going to end up as being the perfect ethical human being. But we think that they could be a better human being in terms of the ethicality of their decisions while also allowing them to make better decisions for themselves at the same time. So if we get away from the notion to focus on ethics means to give up any self-interest and simply do what's morally best to the notion of can I do better? I think that there's so much that a leader can do to create a more ethical organization. Thanks for some sustainable ethicality. I think what you're saying is organizational design is important because you want to, in many ways, guide your, your employees, guide your customers, guide your stakeholders, right? In university, perhaps guide your students towards more, more ethical decisions, right? And your responsibility is to kind of make the path of least resistance the one that is the ethical one, right? I mean, sure, maybe in some philosophies, it's only ethical if, if it's difficult. But I think if you're ultimately interested in getting the right outcome, then you want to design it so that doing the unethical stuff is, is harder than, than doing the ethical stuff, right? Amen. And managers screw that up when they give their people a directive and say, do whatever it takes. That is an invitation to cut corners and to behave in ways that raise ethical concerns. So we ought to be concerned about process. And as a leader in an organization, yes, you want to keep in mind a system that rewards the people within your team or your organization from behaving in a way that you would be proud of. And Greg, there's um, an implicit assumption in your question that ethics go against maximizing welfare to self. And I think so often that that isn't true. So Don is among the most ethical people I know, and he's happy. He smiles all the time. And he's also a leader in the high school. He's an academic dean. And my guess is just having his attitudes is a good start. And then he could think about how do I move from having these sets of decisions and patterns of behavior myself, but how do I create environments where other people will move in the same direction? Now, I think towards the end of the book, you talk about evaluating these things that we call nudge with other types of, of interventions, right? And, you know, some people are overselling the idea of, of nudges and saying, you know, sometimes you have to use a little bit more forceful efforts to direct behavior and to direct decision-making. Should we think about establishing kind of nudge units within every organization or will, will this idea of experimentation and evaluating interventions through evidence be so pervasive that we won't need separate independent units, right, within organizations and governments? Great idea. Let's do it. Nudge units in every organization. And wouldn't it be great if exactly as you describe the insights, recommendations, and practices that they advocate become so 
commonplace and universally adopted that they work themselves out of a job. That would be awesome. And even if we can't convince the CEO to run an experiment, because in traditional organizations, it's very tough to get organizations to run true field experiments, to at least think through what does the best behavioral science tell me about the decisions that I'm about to make. Like Don, I'm a big fan. There should be far, far more use of true experimentation in organizations. There should also be more use of using the best evidence that we currently have in organizations, and leaders can set the tone to make those things happen. Do you think that everybody in an organization is in a leadership role to some degree, right? I think we tend to think we want to train leaders in business schools, and then people say, well, look, everybody can't be a leader. You need to have some followers or nothing's ever going to get done. But I think increasingly everyone is in some kind of leadership position to some degree, even if you're at the so-called extremity of the org chart, right? You are in a position where you're influencing others, right? So is it too far-fetched of a notion to argue that, you know, leadership is something that everybody has to think about? If leadership is about affecting the behavior of those around us, then each and every one of us has some power to exercise leadership. Now, by virtue of their structural location in the organization, some of us have more such influence than others. But it is common for people to make the mistake of underestimating how much influence they have to guide the thinking, guide the behavior of those around them. And one of the hopes that we had in writing our book is to help people acknowledge those opportunities and see them. Max is nodding. I'm assuming he's agreeing. (laughs) I was agreeing with Don. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So when I read this book, I think that there is, I don't want to call it a new discipline, but I think there's a new kind of rapprochement between uh, what we might think of as organizational design and and organizational uh, behavior, right? Do you think this is going to require a reshuffling to some degree of the way in which we partition our kind of research domains and the way in which we partition our curriculum? I know that at some schools, we we do a very good job of integrating all of the coursework and they kind of blend together and blur together so that the students experience something of a continuous pedagogy. But then when we go back to the research side of things, then everybody goes back to their individual journals or individual academic groupings and so forth. Do you see these academic groupings as being in need of a little bit of a, a reshuffle or a reshake to reflect the fact that these things are blending? So I think it's easy to identify a blending at the borders, exactly as you described, Greg, where the success of behavioral economics, the success of judgment and decision making, that these clearly occur at the intersection of fields where cross-fertilization leads to inspiring new insights and useful applications. At the same time, I think that we have to acknowledge the pressures as a field develops encouraging specialization, and that's sort of operating in opposition to the broadening and blending at the borders of fields. So it is just sort of an inexorable process as sciences develop that people, in order to be able to contribute, become ever more specialized in their area of study. So I think both are going on. So, Greg, uh, uh, we've alluded to my age earlier with your 1986 comment. And so I was around in the 1980s where the boom topic was negotiations. So as of 1983, there were about three universities in the world that taught negotiations. And now every major business school in the world teaches negotiations. That didn't occur because Howard Rafa or anyone else stood up and told other people you should teach negotiations. It happened by creating courses that were liked by our students. And over time, people were intrigued by what we were doing, both what we were writing, but also how we taught negotiations. So I, I don't think it's my job to tell the next generation that they should be teaching a different course or to redesign their curriculum. In fact, I think it's actually specifically not my job to do that. But I certainly can influence what people might want to do through the creation of research and teaching that other people might decide is a good model to emulate. And I would think that's the pathway for things to change rather than pitting a battle between the current mode and some new mode that we might design. So 
I'm perfectly happy sort of putting the burden on us to provide a book and maybe how we teach the ideas in this book in ways that other people want to adopt it and extend it further. Well, when this book came out, it wasn't called the Behavioral Economics book. I don't even know whether Behavioral Economics had kind of branded itself yet, but you know, it was definitely a decision science book. But now I think it's clear that this was sort of a seminal text in the early days of behavioral economics. And behavioral economics has clearly moved from a descriptive science to one that is, is a practical science. And it's one that's being used and applied in organizations everywhere more and more. And I think this book, Decision Leadership, really does a great job of blending the observational with the practical. And I should mention that there are a whole bunch of other books that I have here. This one, Blind Spots, which was another fantastic one, Power of Experimentation. And Don, of course, your book, Perfectly Confident, which I don't have with me at the time, but I really appreciate both of you joining me, Don and Max. I think the stack of books that between the two of you should keep someone very busy on, on a desert island for a long period of time. Thanks for both joining me today. Sounds like a fine plan. And hopefully they can get off that desert island and come back and get other people to use our books as well. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. This is Unsiloed brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 